So it's, it's a smart device that allows you to do high efficiency exercise in a completely new way. So it's kind of like gives people a whole new opportunity that's not out there because otherwise, like you're saying, it's all sort of, I train, you train, she trains we're going to compete on price because we'll all just do basic training. Hey, what's up everybody. And welcome to masters in fitness business podcast, where you get to stand on the shoulders of giants. And today I'm bringing you a giant from the great state of California, Dr. Mark Chavez. He is, he's got a quite uh, a unique backstory in that he is a, a physician trained in emergency medicine and worked in the ER for a long time and then got burnt out. And hopefully he'll tell us uh, kind of his journey as we get into it. But then he went kind of on a walkabout and that's where he found himself uh, dabbling in the fitness industry and created a whole new category that he thinks that a lot of trainers and businesses can use to capture a new um, revenue stream of online training. So I get all of that right, Dr. Chavez, uh, Mark? Absolutely. Okay, good. Well, welcome to the show, man. Um, I'm glad to have you. Hey, thank you. It's great to be here. Okay. And then um, tell us a little bit about kind of your backstory, how you got into this whole thing, uh, how you got burnt out into um, emergency medicine, because most people would be like, emergency medicine, that's pretty cool fucking shit, you know? Mm -hmm. But, you know, why would you want to leave that and kind of jump into this arena? So you want to share that with the listeners? Sure, definitely. Well, I, I, it starts uh, back at home. I grew up as an only child, which is kind of unique. I, I always ask people about their, uh, you know, siblings and I like to get an idea of how many people are only children, but it's not that many. So, but the point is you spend a lot of time alone mm -hmm. kind of thinking about things. So I was, I was more of a deep thinker and uh, I, I actually enjoyed my time alone, but my father was in the uh, bodybuilding scene. So he was a semi-professional bodybuilder. And the one thing I did observe, cause that's, I got really good at observing people and kind of just watching is uh, the consistency, the dedication, the commitment that he had to his his craft, bodybuilding. And uh, that's something I think that I, I got a lot from. I really learned that lesson of the, the you have to get up and, and work every day. Mm -hmm. There's no days off. Yeah, there's a balance, but you know, I have a different idea about balance. But so growing up with my father, who was also a Marine, and there was a lot of discipline, a lot of commitment. And uh, he was a pretty hardcore guy. So I, I tried to get that, learn that from him. Now, fast forward to kind of end of high school, I was not a very good student. I wasn't very, I wasn't engaged in the school. It didn't really do it a lot for me. I thought it was kind of boring. So I barely graduated. And then I was trying to figure out what next, what do you do after high school? So I thought one of the things I'd really like to do is I like to challenge myself. And so I started asking around, you know, what's the, diff the hardest thing to, major in and everyone kept telling me medicine medicine's so hard it's you have to do so much training so much school so i thought all right well that's what i want to do because it sounds like a challenge and i want to take on the hardest challenge there is so it wasn't because i wanted to help people or anything like that <laughs> i mean i could, you know, at, at some baseline level want to help people but that wasn't my motivation it was because it was a hard thing to do and i wanted to basically climb that that mountain so okay. I was able to get through, it was, it was tough, it was fun though. And uh, I thought, well, what's next? You have to choose a specialty. And I, just like you said, you know, emergency medicine sounds really cool, like exciting. It's kind of like the doctor's doctor, right? It's like, you have to be prepared for anything that comes in. Yeah, it's like I mean, straight out of Grey's Anatomy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's much different than being like a pediatrician or a family uh -huh. medicine doctor, you know. And in fact, one of my professors had the saying that it's my favorite saying is the last thing a sick kid needs is a pediatrician. And so <laughs> what that means is, you know, pediatricians usually take care of well, well kids and do immunization shots. But when you have a sick kid, you know, they look to the emergency medicine physician. So you're right. It was exciting and it was fun, but that lasted about 10 years. And then I got pretty burnt out. 
part of the reason was I got very unhealthy during my, my work as emergency physician. The, the sleep cycle is terrible. Some days you're working uh, mornings, some afternoons, some you're doing overnights, and it changes on a continual basis. So you never really get your sleep patterns down, and that really affects your metabolism. As you know, it affects your ability to regulate your, your metabolism and how your energy level is, your focus, all that. So I think that's really what it came down to is like, I was looking at my colleagues who were not that much older than me, maybe 10, 15 years older than me. And they were having heart attacks, they were having strokes. And I was like, man, is this where I'm headed? I and mean, then I was already got overweight, I wasn't exercising. The worst food on earth is in an emergency medicine break room. So <laughs> that's the kind of stuff we're eating, you know. Yeah, like, like bagels and donuts. Bagels, donuts, Krispy Kreme, uh, mm -hmm. you know, burgers, yeah. all that stuff. So, and then really what came down to, I was having a really bad week, a really bad week in the ER, just stressed, not sleeping, a lot of sick patients. And one week I had two kids come in on two different days. Uh, I think it was like a Tuesday and a Wednesday I was working. And one was seven, eight-year-old, seven-year-old and eight-year-old. And uh, they both died uh, for different reasons. One was in a, a really bad accident. And the other one had a heart problem that hadn't been diagnosed. It was a congenital heart problem. But that kind of just threw me over the edge. I mean, there's nothing like losing young children and having to tell their parents that they're no longer with us. And uh, I just kind of couldn't take the stress. And I just, I just quit. Yeah, I can, I can definitely see how that would be hard on you. Um, and I mean, I don't think it parallels, but I guess the closest parallel that I can make is that when I opened my gym, going on six years ago, um, the first two years, I was in the worst shape of my life. Now you think, here I am a trainer, running a, a personal training studio, how can you be in the worst shape of your life? And it's just that, you know, I threw myself into it because I wanted it to be successful. And then everything got every everything that I needed got put on the back burner, uh, meal prepping, eating right, training, sleeping, all of those things kind of went on the back burner. And as a result, I wound up in the worst shape of my life. And so I, I had to uh, course correct a little bit and start carving out and protecting time for myself. So I can definitely relate to that. So what, so after that you got, and you lost the two kids and that was the tipping point for you. So what, where did you go from there? Where did, where did your walkabout take you? And that's just a phrase that I use, but I think it's pretty, pretty handy. Yeah. Well, I only knew one thing at that point and is that I had to get back into health. Like I had to make my health my priority. So what I wanted to do was I didn't know anything else other than that. And I took a year off of the emergency room and just focused on my health. And I started, cause I know how to get healthy, you know, as health professionals and fitness people, we know what to do. It's just sometimes we don't do it. Right. So, yeah. So as a part of that journey to get myself healthy again, I started using medicine balls. I hadn't used medicine balls a lot in my career or in my life, but I thought, it was pretty cool. I had a small place near the beach. I didn't have a lot of room. I'm not a big, uh, you know, gym person. I don't, I don't go out to public facilities. I like to do my own thing. I like to go outside and work out. So I started using the metal balls and uh, I found that they were really cool, but they were limited. And I thought, you know, the medicine ball hasn't been sort of innovated in since its inception 2000 years ago. I mean, it started in the medical field. That's why they're called medicine balls. Doctors would prescribe these heavy balls for their patients to do these various exercises and movements. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, if we could develop, if we can think of a way to hold a medicine ball in a single hand, the same way a basketball player palms a basketball, then that opens up the possibilities of the types of movements and exercise we can do. So effectively, we're putting weight on our limbs and allowing our limbs to move around in space with this attached weight to it. So you can start thinking of all the cool different things you can do. And so I started experimenting with ideas to make a medicine ball that effectively would allow you to do that uh, without having to grip it. It would just stick to your, your hands or your feet or your limbs. Yeah. And then you also had, uh, your father had uh, an incident too that uh, also inspired you to 
uh, innovate the medicine ball. You want to share that one? That yeah. Story? Yeah. So after about a year of me sort of playing with these designs and, and I come up with different prototypes that were handmade, I actually started doing some work with a family medicine physician. I was seeing patients twice a week doing family medicine, which again, it was completely different than emergency medicine. But the important part of that is I got to see patients over and over. And I realized a lot of people were having trouble holding things because they had poor grip strength. They had arthritis, they had prior strokes, they had nerve damage. They may have had recent surgery for whatever reason. And then at the same time, I was seeing these patients and realizing that it was such a big problem for people to hold weight. My father had an injury during a surgery. So post recovery, after the surgery, he was not able to close his hands anymore. During the surgery, they damaged his median nerve in both hands and that left him with basically a claw hand. And that was a pretty devastating injury for my father since he was a bodybuilder and you, know, mm -hmm. you kind of have to hold weight when you're lifting it. Mm -hmm. I started seeing all these things and then looking at the ball and I realized this ball could be a lot more useful for a bigger, much bigger audience than just having a cool product. I thought of all the people that can use it effectively who can't use weight now because they can't hold it for whatever reason, their grip doesn't allow them to. Yeah. I mean, I mean, for me, that's a cool story. Like, like I told you in our earlier phone call, I think the best way to transfer information is through a story. And I think that that's a really cool story. I really like it. So now you've, you've kind of scaled up on this medicine ball. You've gone from making them and the, the prototypes in your garage to where now you are manufacturing them and they're much more steady, reliable, durable, all of those things. Correct. That's correct. Okay. So the thing that I, I'm interested in is that as I talk to people in the industry, both in and out of the industry, I know people that have, and myself included, that have a brick and mortar business. I mean, it's, it's never been more difficult to get people to walk through the door of your gym than now. Um, so I think it's really fiscally responsible to try to find other revenue streams. Of course, we do the virtual training, but we kind of roll it into our regular membership. So what I'm looking for, what I want to talk to you about, and we talked about it a little bit is creating a whole new model, you know, where you, where you're creating a category, you become the leader in that category. You have certifications in that category. You have a whole method based around the category that you can use to create a whole different revenue stream other than people coming in the brick and mortar, correct? That's correct. So you want to, you want to share that idea uh, with the listeners and, um, and then we can also talk about, I also want to get to um, why you wrote the book that you wrote and also the entrepreneurial coaching for physicians and how that works. But first I want to get into this, this model. You want to share that with the listeners? Absolutely. I mean, I'm a big believer in being able to do something that only you can do. So that allows you to do a couple things. You can't be replaced easily. You can't just be changed out for someone else that can do the same thing. But it also separates you from all the, the noise. There's so much noise, it's hard to pick up the signal. Uh -huh. Especially now with everything going online and there's so much advertising and there's so much new sort of products coming out. What, what, what I think the best strategy is for us as business owners and, and people who are trying to create our own paths within the business world is to find a niche and really own that niche and, and, and really make it something unique to yourself. And so one of the big sort of ideologies or philosophies behind that is uh, you may have heard it it's called the blue ocean strategy. Mm -hmm. It's also called the star principle. It's also called the law of category. These are all different ways of saying that to create your own methodology, your own exercise method, your own category within fitness, and then really own that space and, and make it what, it what you want to make it and really serve a, a specific group of people that you see yourself being the best at serving 
so for instance, the, the product is called the gravity ball and the method is called the gravity ball method. But really it's a grip free methodology, meaning that having this weight and not having to hold the weight, but having the weight being able to attach to your limbs, that allows you to exercise in a completely different way. Because if you think about weights, there's no other way other than if you maybe attach a ankle weight to your wrist or to your ankles, that you can attach weight to your limbs without having to hold it. As a result of that, the exercise methodology allows you to do a different type of and different form of exercise, grip free training. So much like TRX developed suspension training, if you say BOSU ball, you think of balance training. If I tell you um, different, like besides TRX, stick mobility, you think of mobility. Mm -hmm. So grip free training, I want people to think of gravity ball. That's gonna allow people to, so for instance, if you're a trainer, you might develop certification in the gravity ball method, and then you decide that you wanna target people who have grip strength issues, or you want to target an older population because of their trouble with arthritis and other joint disorders. That would make you stand out in a crowd of people, especially when those people, those baby boomers are looking for trainers. That's going to really make them uh, be interested in, in, your, in your messaging and what you're doing to help them stay fit. Yeah, and I like that a lot. I mean, because I like the fact that you're creating your own category, kind of, kind of like what you said with stick mobility, they created their own category. TRX with suspension training created their own category. And then you have the balance training with the Airx pads and the BOSU and all of that and the wobble boards, all of that stuff. They created right. their own category. So you're talking about creating your own category with this grip free training. And the thing that I like most about that is that the thing that kills people the most and, and gets their fitness business to drown in the noise is becoming a commodity. Well, you can go here and get personal training for $19.99, or you can go over here and get it for $29.99. You know, then it becomes a, an object of price and not the product or the expertise. But when you create your own category, any way that you can package fitness up as a product, right. then it it moves you out of that commodity category and it automatically moves you to a higher frequency where more people have an ability to hear you, especially if you're targeting a specific audience. That's exactly right. Right. And yeah, even so more than a product, you know, I would say I was going even further and say a brand, you really want to develop your own brand and that product yeah. all underneath that brand. But brand is really everything that the public experiences with your business with your with your pitch with your products with your service so yeah okay awesome well i really like that um so tell me how this so the other thing that i like what you said too is is like baby boomers people with arthritis or grip strength those are also the people who tend to be in the high risk category right now with covid and so they are really going to be um, reluctant to come into your gym. So this is something that you can market to them to do in their home. You can create an affiliate link with the gravity ball. So you get a, you get a chunk of that when you sell them the gravity ball. And now they have this product and you're the only person in town that is certified to do this. So you're able to create that market and then capture the market, correct? That's correct. And, and you're one of the only people in town that can effectively teach them how to use the product safely and effectively, which a lot of those people really care about the, the safety of the equipment. They're not going to be right. using iron kettlebells and, and iron dumbbells and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, I like that. So tell me how you see this working then as a business model and as creating your own brand, your own category and, and how like some, uh, a trainer just starting out or an online trainer or a trainer with a brick and mortar might approach this. Well, the first thing would be to get familiar with the product and be able to understand 
how valuable the product is once you know how to use it and how to show other people how to use it. So, you know, it's very similar to if you don't know how to use a gun, you might kill yourself because you don't know what a gun is, right? Or putting a, a pair of nunchucks in my hands is not the same as in putting them in Bruce Lee's hands. And, you know, I'll probably hit myself in the head and knock myself out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Afro ninja. Yeah. So the first thing is really getting familiar with the product and understanding its value. And then once that you have that concept, then you can understand like, oh, well, I, now that I don't understand how this product works and how the different uses are, I could target different audiences depending on what their interests are and what their needs are. And then what, what I'm good at. So, you know, I might be good at athletic training. I specialize in working with upper arm, you know, rotator cuff with overhead throws with baseball players, with tennis players. So then I would develop a unique program, a training program that uses a gravity ball that takes them through that particular area of the body to basically enhance their performance if I'm a baseball player or any kind of other athlete. Now, if you're a general fitness person, you might develop a fitness program that can be put online that is targeted to the silver, the senior population. You know, low impact, very simple movements, very very uh, emphasizing mobility, that kind of thing. Because of the tool, it allows you to develop different exercises specific for different audiences and not have to have anything else in terms of equipment. It has all of these exercises built in um, because of the design. So it's, it's a smart device that allows you to do high efficiency exercise in a completely new way. So it's kind of like, gives people a whole new opportunity that's not out there because otherwise like you're saying it's all sort of i train you train she trains we're going to compete on price because we'll all just do basic training right and that's no way to survive i mean that's a recipe for um, yeah for disaster it's a race to the bottom for sure yeah. so um the and the, then the other model that i think of and and i don't know if you are familiar with martin rooney who's a a pretty well-known coach in the, in the fitness industry. And he created a whole new uh, licensing program called Training for Warriors. Uh, and it was kind of built kind of around, he probably wouldn't be happy with me saying this, but it's kind of around CrossFit. It's kind of crossfit -y, but it's, a, it's enough of not CrossFit with some kind of movement thrown in that helps you clean up some things. Um, but he's able to license that across the country. So, I mean, there is a potential to do something like that with this one as well, correct? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so for All instance, right. at your facility, I mean, if you were certified in the gravity ball method, you would be an affiliate. You can teach that both individual and group, as well as one thing that I've noticed a lot of business owners waste is space. They have a lot of space there and they don't use it to maybe sell products, to have other revenue streams, maybe beverages, drinks, but that can be sold out of your facility. Whereas first introduced to the potential clients through your facility by using it to work with them, they loved it. They purchased it from you. And then, like you said, you get, you get some of that commission for each of the sales on space that you weren't using before. You just set up a little area where you're where you're showing them okay got it i i like it a lot so how many um how long have you been working on this thing you know i started about six years ago creating the hammy prototypes and sort of thinking about the design and stuff yeah it's been a slow process because i had to do it you know while i was working still and part-time working and stuff right and then how long have you been working on like the the program itself we started the program about two years ago and we, we did our first certifications about six months ago. Okay. So we developed the, the, the basic certification program. And then from there, we're going to start to develop more specific. So gravity ball method for yoga, for Pilates, for athletic trainers, for sports medicine, that kind of thing. Okay. For jujitsu. 
For uh, martial arts, that's right. <laughs> I think that might be a little specific right now, but we. You know. yeah. That might be too. That that's a that's a shallow pool. That's like the kiddie pool when it comes to marketing. Um, but um, I mean, that's just my own thing. Okay, so let's talk about. Let's shift to how this uh, plays into your. Um, your your key physicians of influence and in entrepreneurial coaching for physicians how how does the, how do those two intersect well that program basically is something i've been thinking about for a long time i've had this idea so the idea was i wanted to create a framework for doctors because what i saw in the medical community was very similar to what had happened to me a lot of doctors were burning out and they were getting just fed up with the system, with the kind of work that they were doing because of the, the process that they had to go through. But the thing is a lot of doctors, in fact, most doctors don't know how to do anything other than medicine. And so I saw a big opportunity that since I had been doing entrepreneurship for the last you know, eight years, and I put a lot of time, education and money and investment into that, but I was also on the medical side, I thought it would be great for me to be able to take these doctors train them in entrepreneurship, get them basically started on the right track and then set them out and watch them do these great things as entrepreneurs. Uh, it's just like they just didn't have the skill set. So the, yeah. the key position of influence program was my idea of coming up with a coaching program that would give them the basic skill set in entrepreneurship to be successful. Okay. And when did you launch that? We just launched that like three months ago, our first group, our first cohort, and it's going amazing. It's really, okay. it's really cool. Yeah. I developed a, uh, it's a framework called the CPR squared framework. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of this as you could sort of see is uh, medically related, these acronyms CPR, mm -hmm. because I wanted doctors to already be familiar with, with some of the terminology in terms of the acronyms, but then those cross over into business. So CPR squared stands for care, uh, our communication, product, produce, reputation. And then the last thing is your relationships that you need to develop to be a successful entrepreneur. Because it's all about yeah. relationship building. So yeah, you go absolutely. through those six, those six steps in the program and we teach them all of those areas. Yeah, I really like that because I think it's so imperative if you're going to run a business that you need to take off the technician's hat to use Michael Gerber's The E-Myth. You got to take off that technician's hat and put on your owner hat. It's a different uh, mindset. It's a different perspective and it's a different skill set. Uh, I agree with you 100%, whether you're a trainer or if you're a doctor. I mean, that's why I started this podcast is help trainers take off that hat of the technician and put on the, the business owner's hat. Um, okay. And then tell us about why write a book? You wrote a book, The Five Habits, Five Habits of Healthy People. Why write a book? So that goes back to the CPR squared framework. You know, if we went through communication, care, care means self-care for yourself. It's that's the first thing in the framework. But then the third part, the P, produce. So you have your product and then the fourth part, which is produce. Under produce, we, we teach doctors and entrepreneurs that you need to get your message out to the world. So producing is in the, in the form of podcasting, such as your podcast, mm -hmm. blogging, um, creating content in terms of videos. And, and then one of the other things is writing. So I really believe that public, pub, uh, publishing things, books, articles, white papers, it's a great way to enhance your credibility as mm -hmm. well as get your message out to a wider group of people because that could be shared. It could be sent to people. You know, the, an ebook could be sent to other people on LinkedIn. Um, people are interested in learning more about what you're doing. And having a physical paperback copy at networking events it's the best business card you could ever have. Whether people read the book or not, they're going to keep the book and everyone loves getting a free book and they're going to look at it over and over again, hopefully, you know, when they put it down on their desk at home or in their office at home. And some of them will actually read it. But just having the book and being a published author will give you a lot of credibility. It'll get people reaching out to you. 
wanting you to be on shows, on podcasts, on different, um, you know, platforms where you're talking about your message. Yeah, I like that. It's, it's definitely a resume builder. I mean, anytime you write a book, doesn't matter what it's about. Like you said, it really doesn't even matter if anybody reads it. Okay. Just so the fact that you've been able to write and publish a book gives you automatic credibility and kind of makes you the local expert on whatever topic the book is on right. because you literally wrote the book on it. So I, I, think, I think that's really important as far as raising your profile, reinforcing your brand, and um, just being able to create more revenue for yourself more um, uh, attention to your brand and to your product and what you're doing. Yeah, I yeah. agree with that. One of my favorite um, authors, his name is Daniel Priestley. He writes about entrepreneurialism, but he calls it local star power. You know, having a book, it, it gives you local star power. You know, yeah. yeah. It's just all the things you said. Yeah. It's worth, it's worth the investment. Some people might think about, well, oh, you don't have time to write a book. And that seems like a lot of, work and time and but you know we're in this for the long game and uh we want to build something that's going to last and going to scale and that's going to set us up for the future yeah and writing a book can be kind of intimidating but i mean if you really want to do it it's it's really not that hard at least i didn't find it to be that hard i mean during the uh, the first lockdown earlier this year uh i just hooked up with a ghostwriter and uh, because I had all of the, the facts, I had all of the material, all the content, but I needed somebody who could write and who could um, put it in the form of a story so they could effectively transfer the information to the reader. Uh, and so once I did that and started working with the ghostwriter, it wasn't cheap, uh, but um, it was a relatively painless process to come up with a, a finished product in a book that's that's ready to publish. So, and I agree with you on all those points. I mean, if you, um, I mean, let's just take, for example, if you wrote a book on the gravity ball method for baby boomers, say, okay, bo boomer, here's your gravity ball or something like that, whatever title you wanna put on it. And then you put that out, it really even doesn't matter what's in it. I mean, it does to some extent, but not really then you become that, you get that local star power and then you can um, start putting that out on social media or start marketing that. And that will attract clients towards you so that you can start plugging people into this pipeline and creating revenue from it. Yeah, I mean, well said. I mean, yeah. you said it beautifully. It's, it's really a marketing tool. Yeah, for sure. And a resume builder. Yeah. Okay, so um, how many um people have been certified with gravity ball so far so up to this point we've had two let's see 15 people we've only run okay. a couple certification courses and that's because we've been really busy we we re completely redesigned the product so all our focus shifted from kind of growing out the certification program to redesigning the product because without the product there's no need to have a certification program Right. And uh, one of the things with, a, with our design that we're discontinuing, the current design, which we're going to discontinue right here at the end of the year to introduce our version two, it was, it was just too, it was too expensive to manufacture and it was too difficult to assemble. So that's another thing I've learned in this process is about manufacturing and assembly. And yeah, there's a lot of parts to that, which once you learn those, it's very valuable because then you can repeat it. I know how to manufacture things now and design them and how to tool them and how to package them. And so, yeah, yeah. going through the process is, 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 is hard. Yes, it is hard. And, and that's the thing. I, there's several things that I like that you said. Number one, I mean, you got 15 people certified for right now. So this is a perfect opportunity to get on in on the ground level of this thing, right? And, right. and try to build it. Um, and create that revenue stream. The other thing is, is that a lot of people have a lot of ideas. There's no shortage of ideas. Just go on freaking Facebook. Everybody's got their own ideas, right? Yeah. But uh, most people, when they start pursuing th their ideas, as soon as it gets hard, they quit. And it always gets hard. Yeah. Always, without exception. It's hard. I mean, there are going to be people that tell you no. There's going to be hiccups. There's going to be glitches. 
things are going to fall through the cracks. Like there's going to be a lot of mistakes along the way of climbing that learning curve. So you, you just have to prepare yourself. You just have to know that going in. And if you're really passionate about this thing and kind of build something right from the ground up, then it could pay huge dividends down the road, but you have to know that it's going to be hard. So like, I'm interested in this gravity ball thing. So I know if I go and I get certified, um, then that I'm going to have to, uh, and I, I want to build a revenue stream, target a certain demographic. I'm going to have to put in some work, right? I'm going to have to find out how to market it, how to create the modules, how to sell it, how to create um, the e-commerce from it, all of that stuff. So it's going to be some work. Um, so I have to know that going in and not quit at the first sign of it getting hard because I see a lot of people that do that. Um, and, but when you push through, man, it could be really, really rewarding because we all get into this, this business. Um, I mean, fitness is, I, I would like to think it's a little bit like medicine in that most people get in it because they want to help people. They want to change people's lives. Uh, and in your case, save lives, but, um, well, in our case, save lives too. If you get somebody who's, you know, uh, diabetic, high blood pressure, all of these things, and then you can get them to lose some weight, get off some of their medication, bring their BP down, maybe bring their type two diabetes under control. That can definitely save their fucking life. No question oh, about it. Totally agree. So, uh, I mean, that, I mean, that's the end result at the, uh, that everybody's looking for at the end of the day. So as long as you keep your eye on that prize, then it makes the hard work worth it. Oh, I agree. And the, you know, you should have to work hard. I mean, yeah it's it's that's what makes a difference between people that make it and don't it's if you quit i mean what do you expect i mean i always end with three questions and this is my favorite part of the show because i think we get some of the best answers okay. so um my first question to you mark and i have a feeling i know what it's going to be but i want to see what you say what has been your most successful failure? And by that, I mean, at the time, it seemed like a devastating loss, but you, you were able to take life lessons from that and use those to propel you to greater success down the road. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know if it was a failure looking back, but it would, it would probably be going into medicine and being so disappointed by what I discovered that I couldn't even uh, stand doing the work because the system was so shot and so set up for the wrong reasons. It, yeah. it, it wasn't for the patient or for the providers. And I didn't realize that until I got deep into it and I was already 10 plus years into it because it takes you a lot, of t a lot of time to get to the level of expertise before you can see things as they really are and understand what's happening before your eyes. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you, you don't understand what's happening and it, you don't really un understand what's going on. Yeah, so I can imagine that's frustrating for you. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and what lessons you took from that that you still use today to um, keep you moving forward? Yeah, I'm, the process of, of, of the whole medical system, it, it's really broken. And what I mean by that is because of the, the system of legality that we live in, it's most doctors practice medicine in a very sort of cover yourself mentality. Cover your ass, so, right. Yeah, CYA. And even in medical school, we were taught you should do this in case you are sued for this. You should do Y in case you're sued for X. And at one point I got up, I remember getting up and I said, well, is this medical school or is this law school? And, you know, and my professor was like, well, you got to know these things because, you know, doctors get sued at a very high rate. I'm like, well, I'm, I don't want to learn how to not get sued. I want to learn how to practice medicine. And so when the, when the focus of the medical system is in terms of the providers, the doctors is to not get sued, then the actual point of the medical system, which is to care for the patients, they're two completely different interests. 
and so when I'm doing things for you, if you come to me because you're sick and it's so in case something goes wrong and I get sued, I did all these things. I'm not really addressing why you actually came. I'm just doing stuff and tests and doing uh, studies so I can say I did a bunch of stuff in case something bad happens. But the, you don't need to be a doctor to do that. You just need to be a test order. Yeah. But don't take any skill set. Right? And, right. and that's, yeah, so, so that's kind of what I learned. And I, 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 I can't do this in good faith. This is just bad practice. This is not. So to answer your question, you have to learn how to do things right. But you also have to not, you have to have a model of how not to do things. And so that's always driven me and how to do things and what I think how they should be done right. Because I have this whole system that shows me how it doesn't work and how it should not be done. So how does that play into what you have built with uh, the gravity ball in the entrepreneurial coaching for physicians? Um, models? Yeah. Well, with the program, with the coaching program, my hope is that, and my belief is that if, if we can train physicians to be entrepreneurs because of their sincere desire to practice medicine and help people, they're going to go out and think of innovative ways and create new ways to provide healthcare. So that ha plays in directly to that. Okay. With the gravity ball, what I saw was that sometimes a simple change in a large group can make a profound difference. And so what I realized is if, if there's a hundred million people in our country who just can't do resistance training because they're physically unable to do it because of their hands, well, if we can somehow fix that or solve that problem, like you said, you can save a lot of people's lives. You can save their mobility. You can save their independence. You can save, I mean, so much you can change about their life. Yeah, the quality of their life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I like that answer a lot. Um, that's why, that's why this is my favorite part of the show. Um, because we get to peek behind the curtain of uh, Dr. Mark. Uh, my next question is, isn't since your time in the fitness industry, what has been the biggest surprise that you've had to deal with that you did not see coming? I mean, I think it's what we all, saw this year you know i was just thinking about that and that's that's a great lead into what happened this morning i have one of these wall calendars where it has all 12 months where you can write with the dry marker in every month and every day uh -huh. so what i like to do is the year before i like to plan the entire year out before that year starts mm -hmm. so today just before we actually jumped on the call i erased my 2021 year and i uh my 2020 year. And I was realizing as I was erasing everything I had planned, like none of it happened because of COVID. And I was like, this is amazing. You know, I was going to go to this conference and I was going to do this event and we were going to have this, you know, meet up. And I was just erasing it. And I was like, none of this happened. Who would have ever known this was going to happen? Right. And so that's, that's what it's been. It's like this whole transfer and transformation from in person to online or in home. Yeah. So how did that, how did you pivot for, with the gravity ball in the entrepreneurial program for uh, physicians as a result of that? What, what do you mean exactly? So like you, I imagine with the gravity ball, you probably had plans on going to lots of conferences as, and presenting or, yeah. you know, setting up a booth for the gravity ball That's to right. get the word out there, maybe certification conferences, things right. like that, or meetings with physicians to talk about entrepreneurships that, uh, as physicians. And then obviously you couldn't do that. So how did you shift your business model to still keep the businesses moving forward? Well, we had to change our messaging. We had, to, we had to change our strategy for marketing. We had to change everything over to online digital marketing. You know, the, the, the more people you could remove between yourself and your end user, the more efficient and the more margin you'll get on whatever mm -hmm. your product or service is. And so that actually turned out to be a good thing because initially we were doing a lot of we were thinking a lot of sort of boots on the ground, a lot of contact visits, a lot of in-person stuff. 
But when that all went away, we had to rethink all that. And as you know, those things are a lot more uh, effective and, and affordable to do digital marketing and digital, mm -hmm. you know, your reach is a lot further. You can, you can expand to different markets a lot easier. Yeah, you can target specifically. Yeah. You can target very specific targeting. So it made us rethink that whole paradigm of how we were going to get the word out and to our specific audiences. Yeah. I like that a lot because obviously everybody's had to do that. And, but, and I'm speaking for myself, um, is that a lot, I think a lot of brick and mortar gym studio owners have kind of held steadfast to, no, I'm just going to do my brick and mortar, brick and mortar is going away. You know, I'm going to stay here. People are going to, they're craving normal and they're going to want to come back in and it's just not happening. Right? right. So I think it's important to make that shift to like, even if you want to hold on to your brick and mortar, you got to start thinking ahead of the curve, ahead of the game and thinking about different revenue streams, having some kind of online option, online product to sell things like that, because right now that is the only way to get your word out correct pretty much yep yeah and if you're not using it you're gonna fall behind pretty yeah. bad and yeah. you said something earlier about having to train one-on-one -on -one. it's like if you are exchanging your time for money you know that's um you're gonna cap out very quickly you're gonna limit your abilities so you have to figure out a way to make money without having to change your time for that. Yeah. Well, you have to scale, you know, for sure. You either do small groups or have a, a, a group of trainers that's working for you. Because the other thing is like, if I become the gravity ball expert in St. Louis, right. And then I have all these one-on-one -on -one clients that are coming to me because I am the expert. They want to train with me. And then it gets to the point where I'm maxed out to where I'm burning out. I'm spending so much time, training people one-on-one -on, -one on gravity ball online that I can't do anything else. I can't run my business yeah. because I'm, uh, I'm mired in my business. And then I hire somebody else to do it for me. And then I'm like, okay, I don't have time, but um, Susie here can train you. Well, fuck Susie. I want you. You're the expert. Who the fuck is this Susie? Right. I don't want Susie. And so then you start, you know, losing clients and then, I freak out because I am losing clients and I start to, it's my natural tendency to blame Susie, but maybe I just didn't train Susie right. Or maybe I had the wrong vision from the very beginning, or maybe this is just a, a step in the growth of the business of me stepping back and maybe losing some of those clients to move Susie or Joe, whoever it is back in that place into that spot. But I just think it's important going in, you have to go in with an end in sight of I want this thing to scale. I don't want to be, I don't want a computer or a laptop be, to become a ball and chain around my ankle that I got to drag it everywhere in order to make money, to, to train clients and make money. I want to be able to scale. So I think that's really important. And I, and I, I like that uh, we've touched on that during this conversation. My, my last question to you is where do you go? And I, it sounds like you do a lot of this, but where do you go for your personal and professional development? It's mostly the circle of, of people that I hang out with. Some of them are mentors that I've had for years. And some of them are business partners who have a, a, a different skill set than I have that can complement sort of weaknesses that I not particularly want to focus on, but want to learn more about. Because, you know, I'm a big believer to focus on your strengths. Don't try to make your weaknesses your strengths. Mm -hmm. But there's also a lot of gaps that can be filled in, which will allow you to be a better um, business person, a better thinker, a better strategist. Okay. So I have mentors through business associates I work with. I also have mentors that I work with through the universities that are local. I reach out to different um, departments within the School of Businesses when I'm looking for uh, guidance. I'll go to uh, universities because I kind of been in a university my whole life starting for the last <laughs> 20 years. Yeah. Uh, and then people that have done what I have 
I'm trying to do. I reach out to them. You'd be surprised. You can reach out to people that you might think are unreachable, but they'll, uh, a lot of times they'll get back to you and they'll, they'll be willing to help you out. Yeah. Yeah. I know that's, that's what happened with me. Uh, when I opened my business, I realized about two years in that I need help. Um, you, you don't know what you don't know. Right. And right. so there was uh, one guy in the industry well, it was Frank Nash. And, um, I run into him at a couple of uh, events. He seemed like a really cool guy. And he always said, you know, Oh man, call me up, just ring, buzz me. You know, I'll be happy to help you. You know, but people say that all the time and it's like, it's bullshit, right? You know, you, you call them up and they either they ghost you or they're like, who is this? And, Oh man, I'm kind of busy, you know, all of this stuff. But I, I just said, fuck it one day I need help. You know, so I called Frank Nash and he's like, Hey man, what's up? What do you need? You know? And he wow. sat down and he took lots of time, um, to help me out and listen to what was going on and give suggestions. I mean, he, I mean, he, I mean, he's the real deal when it came to that, you know, and then he got me into this group, the STS, where I met Rick Mayo and, and a couple of other uh, guys who uh, have become my mentors uh, and my peers in that group. So um, I agree with you 100% because I totally didn't think that Frank Nash would respond the way that he did, but he did. I mean, and that's just Frank Nash, man. That's part of the reason why he's so freaking successful is yet... He's a, he's kind of a selfish guy. He thinks differently, which I really like. So what, what are some, it sounds like you read a lot of books. What are some of the books that have helped you up to this point? I mean, one of my favorite books is the entrepreneurial revolution by Daniel Priestley. That's the, uh, the same guy that talks about having local star power by producing content and books and stuff. Another one is, um, you know, blue ocean strategy is something I've always I've read and I go back to, and I, I really believe in, um, you know, I, I like a, a book called the, the war of art by Stephen Pressfield. And that talks about resistance and how he uses the word resistance in what it is that keeps us from doing what we are meant to do. It's that, it's that invisible negative force that stops us from doing the things that, we have the potential to do and know that we should do. And so it's a very short book. It's, you know, I like to do audio books. It's less than three hours. And I listen to that every three months. But a, a good tip on books that I found is I read the, or listen to the same book every about three months, every quarter. So I do that with about five or six books a year. And as opposed to reading a bunch of books every year, I really get that information and that knowledge from, you know, say five to 10 books because I read them over and over again. And that has served me much, much more value over time than reading a bunch of books and not really remembering anything from any of them. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, because every time you go back and, and read a book, it reinforces kind of what you knew the first time. And then you can also look at it through the lens of real life experience of trying it on your own. And so you can maybe pick up some more of the nuances. And then there's also things that you forget that maybe you, that's, you weren't there yet, but now you're there. Because I'm a big fan of like, um, and I have several guests have said this, reading, picking a book or a mentor based on not where you are, but where you want to go, right? And so um, it, it wouldn't have, it would have been for me a waste of time to read some books on business ownership when I was first becoming a trainer, right? I need right. to learn how to become a trainer. But, you know, as those skill sets grow, then I look at, okay, what's my next natural step? Where do I want this to go? And then picking books and mentors based on that. But I really like the idea of, of staying with the same three to five books and reading them several times a year so that you can glean a little bit more information uh, from them each time. I like that. Well, Mark, this has been great, man. Uh, I really appreciate uh, you coming on. Um, I think you're a really cool guy, man. I do. Um, and can you tell people where they can go to get in touch with you or Gravity Ball, get certified, buy Gravity Balls, learn more about it, all of that good stuff? The best place to learn about the Gravity Ball is the website. It's just gravityball.com. Very simple. Okay. And I go by the health MD on social media. 
So you can find me at Instagram at the health MD also on Facebook. So that's my personal brand. Gravity ball is our, uh, our professional fitness brand. Okay. And all of those links will be in the show notes. Just go to trainergym.net, click on this episode of the podcast and all the links uh, to contact uh, Dr. Mark and gravity ball will be right there. So Mark, thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I definitely will be in contact. Uh, like I said, uh, Mark was uh, nice enough to send me some, um, a couple of gravity balls and some training, uh, but I haven't been able to get into my studio because I'm on uh, COVID quarantine. One of my clients tested positive. So I have to, uh, I guess, wait. It was too soon. I took a test and came back negative, said it was too soon, uh, close, too close to the exposure and maybe a false negative. So they wanted me to wait, wait a week or so. So I just took my, my second test today, Friday, and uh, uh, I'm not having any symptoms, but we'll see what the test says. And then I'll be able to go back into Catalyst and start trying the gravity ball. It's out. So once I do, I'm definitely going to reach out to you um, because yeah. I know I will have a ton of questions. So I appreciate Great. it. Looking forward to it, man. Thanks, Jim. Really appreciate it. Awesome, man. Well, have a good rest of your day. You too. Have a great weekend.